What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. It's right down there and it's free. That enables us to keep coming to y'all as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please hit that subscribe button, like our content, share it, talk about it, be about it, each one, teach one, and we appreciate your support in getting us this far. Now, today, we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by one of rap's premier producers. He's produced hundreds of songs, a lot of great material over the years. So I'm very excited to welcome Mike Mosley. Thank you for coming through, sir. Appreciate it, man. How you doing, sir? Man, everything is good, and now it's even better talking to you. That's right. So, That's right. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So I first remember the first three things I remember seeing your name on were the Let's Side, I guess, EP. I guess it yep. would have been, yeah. Uh, and then then down and dirty and gas chamber. So those three, wow. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, this dude is producing these different things. So first, before we get to that actual work, because as I later understood about your musicality, like how and why, when people were getting into drum machines exclusively, or people were getting into rapping or DJing or whatever, you if you did or didn't do that stuff, but you also developed keyboard playing, you developed guitar, you developed drum programming, you developed all these other talents. What was, how and why did that happen for you early on in the game? Okay. So it's dope that you know that those, those three progressions, that's rare. You know what I mean? You have to really be close to me, really know that that progression happened. Right. So, and I did DJ, I started out DJing. I started out. And at the time when I was producing, with E40 and them doing the click um, and be legit, I was DJ. You know what I mean? I was DJing then. So me and my partner, uh, Carl Gandy, he actually told me about you. He's like, man, you need to get on Soaring Show. You know what I mean? So, so, um, so well, shout we out to Carl. To just, Thank you, yeah, Carl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we used to, uh, we used to make music, you know, in junior high and, and, and DJ. And then, you know, uh, we ended up meeting E40 and then we started doing it professionally, you know, but, what happened is, is I realized that I couldn't, I wasn't musically inclined as much. So, but I knew what I was hearing as a producer. I'm like, man, I need this sound. I need that sound. That's when I got Sam Bostic and Sam Bostic, I would play some stuff and I would write some stuff and then Sam would replay it for me as a musician. You know what I mean? And and then he would add stuff to it too. And then I found flat top, you know what I mean? And a flat top is my straight guitar guy. You know what I mean? So, I'm doing what I do. I'm pro programming and arranging and putting all these different elements in. And then I would, okay, now flat top, I need you to do this. Okay, Sam, can you play this type of sound for me? Or can you, you know, here's the sound. And I dial a sound, sound in and I put all group, all the sounds together. And then I had these dudes play certain things. You know what I mean? And then it just progressed and grew from there. You know what I mean? Well, it's interesting you say that because I was wondering <clears throat> how or when I was going to bring this up, but now we'll get to it, which is, one of the things that amaze me about or amazes still does about your career is your ability to work with so many other producers and musicians throughout everything throughout your, the entirety of your career. And that, yeah. how do you think that was able to happen and it developed that way? So I, later on in life, I figured out that I was the type of producer. I'm a Quincy Jones or I'm a Dr. Dre type of a guy a composer, you know what I mean? A, a, a writer. So I understand and I know if I can't play something as good as I can play it, let's get this guy to do it. You know what I mean? And so if I, re and I also realize that I have a talent for dope produ producers and musicians, you know what I mean? That's a niche that I had. I didn't know that that was a talent, but that's just something I was organically doing. But like I say, looking back at it, it's actually a talent of mine. You know what I mean? But that's how I'm able to have a Femi, OJ Tunde or a Rick Rock or, you know, a Sam, you know what I mean? That's how I'm able to have certain guys. And I've never been a hater to be like, oh, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, I, I, I can't do nothing with you because you're better than me or I'm better than you. I never was that dude. You know what I mean? I'm like, let's work on something together and we're going to make a hit song together because you're dope. I'm dope. Let's do it. You know what I mean? That's my mentality, you know? Yeah. Okay. So then how did you end up uh, meeting 40? So 40, we were like street hood dudes initially, you know what I mean? So we roaming around, we just in the streets, just being goons, basically, you know, handling business. So I met him like that. I actually was supposed to meet D-Shot first, but D-Shot, you know, he, uh, the day I was going to meet D-Shot, he had ended up doing a high speed 
And so I was like, okay, I can't meet him now. And so they were like, okay, but you can meet my, you can meet me legit and my brother, right? And so that's how I ended up meeting him. Um, Cause I was supposed to meet with B-Side initially, but today he turned me on the 40 and, and be legit, you know? And so okay. 40 came by, he saw, you know, years go, a couple years go by then. 40 told me he was doing studio time and they had a record, all the Kings men. And, um, you know, he came by my house and saw that I was, had a keyboard and on an anvil case and drum machine. And we are like, what? So he started coming over, you know, we just start coming, building a musical relationship, you know? Hmm. So that's, that's how it turned out. And I, that worked out well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so all of that being said, the, with the let's side, the thing is early in the game, being so early in the game like that. And even though I think people that haven't never been to the Bay or don't understand the geography of it, Vallejo mm -hmm. is not there, like right there, like Oakland, right. like Oakland or San Francisco or even Hayward for that matter. Um, yeah. So that being said, you guys are a little bit removed from everything. Technology isn't that great yet. There's no ease. There's, you know, short obviously is doing doing it big. But other than that, you know, on the street side of things, at least it's not really moving like that. And of course, short and 40 styles are dramatically different. So that right. being said, what made you as a musician, producer, orchestrator, what how did this vision come to where you guys are like man this is gonna work <laughs> um because we were you know we, we we were a little further out but that didn't necessarily mean that we didn't have ambition and we wasn't watching what short and calvin t were doing you know what i mean so we game recognized game you know what i mean we recognized their game so we're like you know what we could do it too we got ambition you know what i mean so let's you know, 40 and was already rapping and, and me and my my people, we uh, we were in Fairfield. So we were even further removed. You know what I mean? <laughs> so people always thought that Fairfield was square field. You know, nobody would never really come there, right? But me in particular, I moved up to Fairfield from LA. So just quite naturally, my mother had me always moving around like we were gypsies, basically. So I was a move around type of guy. So of course, I'm going to Vallejo and Oakland and San Francisco and everywhere else, you know what I mean? So that's how I integrated into being around 40 and other people because I wasn't just the person that stayed in that town and just stayed there and locked in. No, I moved around, you know what I mean, by default. So we we pretty much um, was looking at what they were doing, you know what I mean? And we felt like we can do the same thing, if not better, you know what I mean? So we did our, had our own style of doing, it, you know, and it just grew from there. <laughs> you know clearly and, and that <laughs> that being said with with your mom then what role and what effect did she have on you as your career was getting off the ground so since i can remember my mother always because i was the only child for some years so at least 11 years so they always basically helped me and catered to me and supported me in any and everything i did whether it was good or bad she supported me, you know what I mean? So, and of course, when you're young, you're not really realizing that seeds are being planted in you. So music is constantly being played, records are kind of being played and influenced. So that's why a lot of my music has a lot of old school influences in them because I was being programmed unbeknownst growing up, you know what I mean? By records and music being played uh, at a young, early age. And it just came out into my music production, you know, later on in life. So okay. that, that was a huge influence musically that, you know, that she had on, you know, and support me, buy me equipment, you know, keyboards and mixers and, you know, everything. And just let me be in a room and make the noise, you know. She never really was like, you need to get a job. She never even said that. She's like, this is what you like doing? Okay, cool. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. And people, you know, it's a simple statement, but that type of support and encouragement goes a long, long way. It does. It does. <laughs> And people really underestimate that uh, mm -hmm. in a much different way. My parents really supported me with love and rap. And then as I was trying to be a writer, they were like, hey, similar statement. If that's what you want to do, we're going to try to help you to however we can. And they did. That's so, dope. That's dope. That's dope. I'm that's very cool. I'm very blessed because, you know, at that time, you know, I grew up in Maryland and yeah, there wasn't much publicity about rap and most of the publicity yeah. was negative 
and they didn't yeah. know any they didn't know anything about rap so yeah. yeah it all it all was funneled through me so it worked out That's well great. That's dope. it's like your soul was in a different place you know what i mean your soul was being summoned by the hip-hop thing you know what i mean and it just drug you you way up in maryland how did you even get into this you deeply in it especially into the bay area stuff that i've come to know you know you know a lot about bay area stuff so that's that's nothing but a spiritual soul type of thing seem like you know what i mean you've been yeah. teleported yeah man. <laughs> yeah i've been uh you know get to live my dream every day and with the bay i just all regions of rap i love and the bay is obviously one that is at the top of my totem pole because I've, yeah. I've spent a lot of time with the artists from there being there all kinds of stuff so it's amazing yeah. but with yeah. let's side too uh you know i know as music as rap in particular evolved credits became more specific but on let's side i always remember it was like just produced by all y'all so mm -hmm. how uh i think people that have never been in the studio or now that stuff mm -hmm. is so easy they don't understand how things used to be so mm -hmm. I wanted you to explain like the the camaraderie effort. Like I think a lot of times people get confused as one person in the room and they're all by themselves doing this and the other person's writing their lyrics somewhere else. So I wanted you to speak of early on with the click on Let's Side and then Down and Dirty. Yes, they're family, but it also the, the communal aspect of the actual work as far as making the music, writing the rhymes, editing, changing the lyrics, mm -hmm. the beats, what have you. Mm -hmm. So pretty much um, as a producer, me as a producer back then, um, I mean, we didn't know, you know, what we were doing. But I, like I said, I always be looking back at what we actually did, you know. So what we actually did was I'm hearing things, I'm hearing sounds and I'm hearing different ideas. And so we're we're collabing, you know, the artists are the 40 and be legit. We're collabing back and forth. Of what do you think about this? Should I say it like this? Should I say it like that? No, 40, say it like that. No, B, say it like this or because this is what I'm going to do once the eighth bar hits. You know what I mean? So that's a real production work versus nowadays, they just do a track how they want to do it and they send it. There's no, no, no organics to it. You know, that's why a lot of old soul music, a lot of old music, that's why they're hits because a lot of communal people were interjecting ideas and, 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 and coming to one conclusion and all agreeing upon one thing and it made this dope piece of work. And that's what classic are made from. You know what I mean? So oh, that's pretty much what we were doing. We didn't know it, but that's how it ended up being. You know, when you, it's like George Clinton in Parliament. It's a ton of people, but he's the one at the end of the day, like, you know what? I didn't like the way that horn sounded. So let me just take that out. Because he, that's his specialty. You know what I mean? That's his talent. And everybody recognized that and respected that. That's what your talent is. So you're the producer. You know what I mean? But that's pretty much what we were doing then. Okay. And then why didn't, uh the let side stuff a lot of it get on to down and dirty what was the decision to not carry it over it wasn't um i don't think i think it just what it was i think it was what it was it wasn't like okay let's put this on there we, it wasn't you gotta remember we don't think how we now how we were thinking then that was just okay that's it that was that was it that's done and over with now let's move on type thing so this is the new one you know what i mean wasn't no rehashing or none of that stuff you know Technically, I don't technically know, but that was 40 and, and uh, be legit and, uh, and St. Charles, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't know what that deeper conversation was, but it wasn't like, oh, you know what? It was just over with at that point. That belonged to that prop body of work. Now we're working on click and that belongs there, you know? Okay. And yeah. then for Down and Dirty and then getting with Gas Chamber, with Down and Dirty, if because the credits there are a little jarbled too. <laughs> but yeah. I was trying to understand Gas Chamber, you and Sam Bostic did the whole thing, but Down and Dirty, it seemed like you went from doing a lot of Let's Side to not as much on Down and Dirty. So is did you not do as much or as many songs or work as much on it because you were doing SIBO, a different reason? Like what was happening? No, um, I think that, um, you know, because I was... In the studio, I had a studio, but I wasn't in the studio like Studio Tone was. Studio Tone actually had a studio. So I wasn't as available and really taking it as serious as Studio Tone was, because Studio Tone was a lot older than us. You know what I mean? So this was his business at the time. He had a recording studio. So I was just a producer 
a, a hobbyist and, and a guy just producing beats and making stuff here and there. You know what I mean? So, you know, and I didn't really know or understood that we could really make money off of it until at the end, until at the end of uh, Left Side. And then I realized that, you know, you know, Cash was getting money like six figures. I'm like, what? We making six figures? I'm like, oh, okay. So <laughs> that's when the whole SIBO thing, and I got serious. I'm like, hold on, wait a minute. <laughs> we got to make some money. So I got introduced to SIBO, and that's when, you know, and that's when I met Sam after uh, the Click album. I met him during, after that, in between that space of SIBO and the Click. Cause I would just randomly rent studio time at different studios and just work in those studios. And Sam's daddy, uh, uh, um, Bill Bosick had a studio that Sam was working out of and, you know, working at. And so that's how I met Sam at the studio. <laughs> we doing some just random time on other stuff, you know? Wow. Yeah. And, and then personally, how did you and Sam Bostic bond so well? Well, Sam, you know, he was, you know, traditional, uh, traditional R&B music producer and he was super dope. He was playing me some stuff in the studio. I'm like, man, this dude, it just blew my mind, right? I didn't realize, you know, that he was that dope. And I didn't know at the time that he had already had record deals. You know what I mean? And so I was telling him what I was doing and he ended, ultimately started becoming my manager at first to help me sort out my business affairs with, you know, on how to move in the industry, you know, copywriting, publishing, all these different things, right? So we were doing that at first. Then, you know, I would occasionally, I would ask him, hey, Sam, can you play something on this and play something on that? And he would, you know, because he knew how dope he really was. You know, he knew he was like a prodigy type of dude, right? So he would, you know, he would, you know, play a few things for me here and there. And then at some point, then he started seeing that we can make money. He was like, you know what? It's actually kind of working and it sounded kind of dope. Let me do a little more of this, you know what I mean? Because because he was initially an artist, so everybody wants to do their own thing and be an artist initially, you know what I mean? So, you know, back then, a lot of people didn't really think that rap was really going to really make the money or really get you anywhere like that, like R&B music had done for so many years, you know what I mean? So rap was fairly new to all of us, especially on the business side. But once, like I say, once we all realized that we could make a living off of it, you know what I mean? We really got that much more serious, you know? So that's how me and Sam, you know, you know, grew into, you know, our production thing. And then how did uh, Sibo, how did you guys get introduced to him? Sibo, uh, uh, we got introduced to Sibo by E-40's cousin T, his name Freddie. So he was from Sacramento. So he had known Sibo. So he was, you know, around 40 and B in, in St. Charles. And he saw <laughs> the type of money everybody was making. So he like, you know what? It goes back to that game recognized game thing. He was like, you know what? <laughs> I got an artist. I see that y'all not really using Mike Mosley that much. You know, I think he dope. You know what I mean? So let me, I'm gonna just do something with Mike. You know what I mean? So T got at me. He's like, man, I want you to produce, you know what I mean, Sebo's album. So I told Sam, I'm like, dude, Sam, I'm working on the Sebo album. Let's, let's produce Sebo's. You know, let's work on Sebo project. So I had a one bedroom apartment, like the Sebo <laughs> said. At that apartment with the mattress on the floor, and I would be in there, you know, um, making music and arranging stuff. And Sam put some stuff on there, and flat top would come and do some stuff, you know what I mean? So, and Sebo was rapping, you know, it was just like really organic how it was happening, you know, it's like really weird just looking back at it, how it just fell together so perfectly because we didn't plan it and we just were doing it. We wasn't even trying to make nothing happen. We just was trying to, okay, let's do some tracks, <laughs> you know? See where right. we get end up, you know? In the beginning, hip hop was ruled by the East Coast. Then the West Coast rose to prominence, thanks to gangster rap. Right hip hop changed the world. Gangster rap changed the narrative. I'm representing for the gangsters all across the world. And then changed the world again. Cause I'll come and take your life away. The history of gangster rap features unheard stories, unseen photos and documents, all with exclusive interviews from the founders and players who shape gangster rap. I think a real gangster rapper has to scare you a little bit. The history of gangster rap written by veteran rap journalist Soren Baker. In stores now. Yo, what up? This is DJ Quick. Be sure to pick up my homeboy Soren Baker's book, The History of Gangster Rap, if you really want to know what we do.